hi all, I hope you're well. Um, thank you for coming back to my channel and for your support on my last video, I really appreciate it. Um, this is the official start of my Geography A-Level revision series um, and I'll be interspersing these videos along with my vlogs, my lifestyle content, other sit-down videos, etc. Um, so this is just a new aspect of my channel, um, so go and check the rest of them out if you have a free minute. Even if you're not studying geography at the moment, why don't you just stick around? You might even learn something new that might be helpful for one of the many million Zoom general knowledge quizzes that we're having at the moment. So stick around and see what you might learn. If you watched my last video, you re may remember me mentioning that I was going to split this series up into three sections. This topic falls under category number one, under the inquiry question, why are some locations more at risk from tectonic hazards? So let's begin. This little section is the background on the case study Nepal. So Nepal is found between India and China in South Asia. It sits right on the boundary between the Indian and Eurasian tectonic plates, as you will be able to see here if I insert a nice little graphic for you. These plates are known as a collision boundary. It is a destructive plate margin where two plates are pushing up against one another above the land's surface. This build-up of pressure creates vast landscapes such as the Himalayas, which were formed in this collision zone by the plate boundaries moving together and pushing up. This release of pressure um, can result in earthquakes such as the one that occurred on the 25th of April 2015. In April 2015, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake hit Nepal, but this wasn't a surprise. The week before, scientists had met in the country's capital, Kathmandu, to discuss how the country would prepare for the next big earthquake that would happen. On the 25th of April 2015, the release of pressure from the collision zone created an earthquake. The epicentre, where the quake is on the Earth's surface, was located 80 kilometres northwest of Kathmandu, at a depth of just 15 kilometres which is a very shallow earthquake, so it could be felt to a greater extent on the Earth's surface. The initial quake, along with its aftershocks, killed a total of 8,633. It injured 21,000 people and made 3 million people homeless. The earthquake that hit Nepal, kill that killed so many and damaged so much, is known as a natural process. It is due to the movement of the Earth's tectonic plates. However, a natural process like this only becomes a natural hazard when it affects people. If the same earthquake was to happen in the middle of the ocean, it may harm no one. Although it may have caused a tsunami, but you get my point. Once a natural process begins to affect people, then it becomes a natural hazard. So a natural process is a natural process until people are added to it and then it becomes a natural hazard. Under certain circumstances, a natural hazard can become a natural disaster. Exactly when it becomes a natural disaster is quite hard to define because there are varying different definitions from different governments. But generally, when a natural hazard strikes a vulnerable population who are unable to cope with the effect of the earthquake due to the resources they have, it becomes a disaster. The, the greater the scale of the natural hazard, so the size, its magnitude, etc., the more vulnerable the population are to the effects of the hazard and the greater the disaster will be. The 2015 earthquake was a major disaster with potentially long-lasting effects. The earthquake itself hit at midday when many people were at work. Many people were in their fields and this did help to reduce the death toll from secondary effects, such as collapsing buildings. Although when many returned home from a day of work, um, they returned home to damaged houses, damaged homes, damaged infrastructure. Um, Nepal actually has a fairly low population density. So although the quake hit and affected the capital Kathmandu, one of the worst areas that were affected were the rural areas. Nepal itself is a vulnerable country. It's one of the world's poorest. It ranks 197th in the world's ranking GDP per capita. Because of this, the Nepalese people were unprepared for the earthquake. The weak infrastructure, such as roads, bridges, safe water supplies and housing, 
were severely damaged and destroyed after the earthquake. Most of Kathmandu's buildings were not built to withstand earthquakes, so they just collapsed. After the initial earthquake, there were many large aftershocks, about a hundred smaller aftershocks, which caused further destruction and deaths. This made the rescue work very dangerous. Nepal is in the Himalayas, so it's very mountainous. The earthquake and its aftershocks also created landslides, which cut off many rural areas from help, making rescue and aid incredibly difficult. The emergency services were not able to cope with the level of destruction and so relied heavily on international aid agencies. Nepal's economy is estimated to have lost about 5 billion US dollars, which is about 25% of its GDP. This was partially due to the fall in tourism after the earthquake. The recovery for Nepal came mostly from foreign aid at a price of 6.6 billion US dollars. However, this is not the final earthquake for Nepal. It sits on one of the most earthquake prone, tectonically active areas in the world. So another earthquake is highly likely. And that brings us to the conclusion of our first episode of the Tectonic Processes and Hazard series. I hope you learnt something. Next time we will be focusing on the structure of the Earth, plate tectonic theory and plate tectonic boundaries, so tune in soon to see that. Don't forget to like and subscribe down below and enjoy the rest of your day. See you soon, bye!